I'm Kelly Harrell, author, animist, and creator of the Weekly Rune. Soul Intent Arts is my soul tending practice, and you're listening to What in the Weird, my podcast in which I talk about runes, animism, soul tending, death walking, and how all of those are in relationship on my path. I started working with the runes in season as a devotional practice to keep myself together. As such, I give thanks to my ecosystem, inner and outer, allies and ancestors for their support in that, and to all the listeners who find meaning in the weekly runecast and this podcast. I'm grateful to be relations with the elder runes and you right here, right now. Thank you to my Patreon supporters who make the sharing of my rune work through the podcast and the runecast possible with their financial support. Please support my work. If you've benefited from the runecast, the podcast, or the free articles on the runes, animism, energy hygiene, death walking, and soul tending on my website, you can show your support by buying my books everywhere, by making a one-time contribution through PayPal, Venmo, or Square or by contributing regularly through Patreon. Just go to patreon.com and search for Kelly Harrell. You can also subscribe to the paid version of The Weekly Rune there. And thank you. The Weekly Rune is out. It's a rune cast that I've done for 11-ish years, focused on Nigel Pinnock's calculation of a pan-cultural runic calendar. It's focused on the current half-month rune, which I center in ecosystem with the elements, directions, seasons, and spirits of place. I invite you to do the same in the way you relate to those beings and see how your rune work deepens. There are many approaches to runic calendars. Check out Nordic Animism if you haven't, and their work with the Nordic Animist calendar, currently honoring the year of On with worldwide celebrations on holy days throughout the year. If you want to learn more about runic calendars, listen to the early episodes of What in the Weird, or just go read the weekly rune. The one that I work with is explained fully at the beginning of every rune cast. The full version of the weekly rune is available weekly only through Patreon, though you can read the highlights for free on my website, soulintentarts.com. All rune casts are fully available two weeks after publication there. You can get notified when they come out by subscribing to my Substack, kellyharrell.substack.com. In this episode of Verbing with the Runes, we're focusing on Gebo. We're Geboing. I feel like of all the runes, people feel really comfortable with Gebo. As in, they feel good receiving it in rune casts, and they typically know what it means. Gift, which naturally branches into partnership. With that, it seems like the obvious verb for Gebo would be to give. I see it. I'm with you. And I'm not not going with it just to be contrary or edgy. In this series of the runes as verbs, my goal isn't to rewrite anything or force an outcome, make something be there that isn't there. I'm seeing the runes as active, feeling them as doable, which to some degree means seeing them as animated alive. With Gebo, people immediately go to gift, as in, I brought you a gift, and partnership, which is often synthesized as romantic partnership. Anytime anything remotely hinting partner comes up in divination, it's automatically ascribed to be romantic, which misses a ton of relationships and relationship possibilities. I feel like we need to get right with that, where Gabo is concerned, as well as to get to what the nature of gift giving really is. My verb for Gabo is to bond. You go with what works for you. As with everything I teach and pontificate on, you have to go with what you feel. So use the wording, the verbing that resonates with you. I chose to work with to bond because American settler culture has forgotten that bonding is the point of giving. Bonding is intentional relationship. It is intentional acknowledgement of relationship. And since the basis of all life is that we're in relationship with everything, the relationship between gift and bond is vital. We are relations. 
the exchange of gifts between us is a tactile representation of that bond. It's only one way to honor that bond as its own life force. But in form, exchanges based in form are a big deal. With a gebo, we hold space for the gift, the exchanging of it, the bond made through the exchange, the gratitude for the exchange, the life force that is the bond itself. That's a lot going on, right? A lot more than just a gift or partnership. And it may or may not be romantic. It's not that it can't be, and it's not that there can't be other ways we project onto bonding. In American settler culture, we tend to romanticize and sexualize relationships right out of the gate. And as a caveat, we always romanticize within the binary. That's putting a limitation on Gebo that isn't inherently there. But if we just assume it is always romantic or is supposed to be, if we assume anything about it, we've degraded the bond. We've projected onto it something that could harm it. We've given the gift with strings attached. We've Gebo zoned the bond. When we don't romanticize Gebo, when we don't project onto it, We've left that bond open for all possible permutations of that life force to expand and experience itself. When we think of it that way, it brings the emphasis back to the bond. Nothing but the giving, the receiving, the bond forged from it. And speaking of attached... Attachment theory has crept into our Instagram feeds over the last couple of years. How we attached to our parents in infancy and childhood, how we attached to our partners in adulthood, all about bonding. And ultimately that bonding is based on the sharing of our unique gift, that which only we can bear into being and feeling how that builds community. What happens when we can't bond healthily, though, or maybe more accurately, can't receive with the openness and vulnerability that bonding requires? What happens when we do our gratitude expressions and it generates distress rather than bondiness? Gratitude practices are all the rage. They have been for the last 10 years or so in spiritual spaces, also sliding into our Instagram feeds. I've never met a single person who said that their gratitude practice sucked. Never. But I have met loads of people who've said that their gratitude practice brought up uncomfortable, unexpected feelings that their practice itself didn't resolve, and that continuing their gratitude practice actually exacerbated those feelings and left them feeling, wah-wah, more ungrateful. What's up with that? I talked about this a lot in the soul tending coursework that I teach, which is that we can't delve into what we project is a positive life imbuing practice without it brushing against some shadow stuff. Whether that's greeting our own sacredness or learning a new approach to meditation, we will always encounter some unexpected discomfort in those practices. And some folks meet that discomfort and think the practice isn't working or it's not the right one for them. Maybe. What's more likely is that we're all connected, as in inside. All aspects of our inner cosmology are in relationship with each other, affecting each other. You can't affect one without affecting another or others. So when we start a gratitude practice to enrich how we soul and form, we're going to churn up stuff that may not be desirable. And frankly, being confronted by unexpected stuff means that practice is working. It means we've gotten quiet on some core fronts, which allow deeper stuff to come to the surface for attention. We forget that these kinds of practices aren't to keep us from feeling things we don't want to, but to give us a way to breathe through when we feel things we don't want to. We do gratitude practices to be grateful for what we have and to cultivate graciousness within us in how we move along. When our gratitude practice isn't having that effect, there be trauma. Trauma is the root of inability to relate to gratitude, the inability to bond healthily. It is the inability to gebo well. 
In the last season of Gebo in the Weekly Rune, I talked about this conflict some, and I also talk about it in detail in my upcoming book, Eldering Well, Tending the Broken Path Through Lore and Interrelationship. It's the working title. I don't know how it's going to end up. My immediate inclination is to say that American settler culture has forgotten gratitude and bonding as integral parts of relating. Though the truth is we haven't forgotten them at all, and the pervasiveness of gratitude practices proves that. We just carry deep wounds around gratitude and bonding. Our ability to express gratitude goes only as deeply as our ability to feel our own worth. Literally. The receptors in our brain that allow us to feel gratitude can't work when we feel shame or unworthiness. They literally cannot function at the same time. And when we feel ashamed and unworthy, we do not feel bonded. We don't feel in relationship or that we belong. And that's a tragic loss of awareness of how we function as animists. A chapter of my book centers on this truth and is based on the work of Dr. Odelia Girdle Craybill, who created a therapeutic model that breaks down this patterning in the brain and demonstrates how we can outcreate it. So when we hit a rough patch in our gratitude practice, we have to get help learning to regulate through that kludge, or we go through life knowing that we want to be grateful, but not really feeling it, and are re-traumatized by trying to force it. And if that's the relationship we have with gratitude, it's the relationship we have with bonding. We have to be able to bond. Though when we can't feel our own worth, we can't bond. We can't gebo. And when we can't gebo, we're missing a vital component of being soul in form, which is community. I know when we say community in American settler culture, we think of a discrete group that we belong to, like family, co-workers, a spiritual or civic group, or people who meet regularly to share interest in a specific topic or to engage a hobby together. When we talk about community in an animistic context, in a soul-tending context, in a gebo bonding is required context, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about an unbroken tradition of land-human relationship interwoven with ancestral ritual and wisdom handed down through the elders, to help us find our unique bond with that tradition. Most of us in American settler culture don't have that, yet are charged to find our soul roots in form that facilitate our agency in support of our calling. If we can't gebo, this doesn't happen. And it's worth mentioning that even if we have an awesome gratitude practice and feel totally worth the bonds we have in our life, that our culture is set up in opposition of that, that it actively tries to tear down such bonds takes a toll on our ability to gebo. It's like tending complex post-traumatic stress. We can regulate around it, but the it is still there. We can bond despite it, yet it still works against bonding. So yes, While most of us are thrilled to get Gebo in a rune cast and we do feel its roots at deep levels of self, we can still have complications around our relationship to bonding. The more we bring attention to that complexity and tap into what we each bring here, the bonds we make are still strong. They're still gifts. Thank you for listening. If you have questions or insights about working with the runes as verbs, in season, or however you feel called to work with them, or if you just want to drop me a line, you can do that at kelly, that's K-E-L-L-E-Y, at soulintentarts.com. Also, check out earlier episodes by downloading them from all the various podcast platforms. You can learn more about me runic book of days and my work by visiting soul intent arts or on instagram at kelly soul arts you can also find notes on this episode on my website under the menu option learn livable rune lore i'm kelly and this has been what in the weird thank you for all that you do in the world